13 and 314 for a shooting at Century Theaters. They're saying somebody is shooting in the auditorium. Roger, keep your fires west of the smoke. It's red hot. I had an officer hit. Send me the world. Don't go over that fence. Don't go over that fence. Grab the shotgun again. Welcome to Tactical Tangents. Welcome back to Tactical Tangents. This is Mike. This episode is brought to you by Loa Boots. Start your day off on the right foot with footwear that was designed for those who stand relentlessly in the face of adversity. I wear Loa every single day for miles on canine searches and for hours on tactical operations and inclement weather. No matter what, Loa keeps me moving. Whether you run, hike, hunt, or fight on the streets or out in the woods, Loa has the gear you need to help you conquer whatever challenges you face. Go check out their new line of trail running shoes at Loa Boots, L-O-W-A Boots.com and get outside for some fresh air and daylight. Loa, for those who know where they're going and won't stop until they get there. And this is Jim. This episode is also brought to you by Manisex. We've talked a lot about the tactical fantasy on this podcast and one of the quickest ways to break your tactical fantasies and actually improve your, your performance is by getting real feedback. One of the ways you can do that is with Manisex. You're not going to get better at shooting on your own. You need practice, data, and coaching. And you need to make the most of your ammo with good live and dry fire training. Manus is a family of training devices that tracks you while you train. It times and tracks everything you do in a drill and coaches you as you go. It is indispensable to taking your shooting to the next level. Go find them on manusx.com. So, Jim, you went to uh, Maui. How was that? It was a blast. It was very expensive, but it was also very fun. I uh, want to stay at one of the big fancy resorts and had a bunch of water slides. The kids loved it. Went snorkeling, saw sea turtles. Uh, it was it was pretty awesome. Uh, while we were there, we drove through the town of Lahaina. And I, it occurred to me we probably should do an episode about what happened there last year. Yeah, which is a, a real bummer. Um, Lahaina was one of the coolest places like I had some of the best food there in Lahaina. There's a restaurant that a buddy recommended to me that I specifically remember the churros there. I can't remember the name of the place. If I I could probably find it on a map, but um, Lahaina is just a cool town, and it's a real bummer what happened there last year. It is. It is a, a beloved town, not just by the locals, but by many, many of the you know mainlander tourists like me who've been there and visited our whole lives and. And, uh, you know, it has a character and a charm that is unique and special sure. and cool, right? Yeah. And it was heartbreaking even almost a year later now, uh, driving through and seeing uh, the wreckage of Lahaina kind of walled off. They've got, you know, kind of barricades up to keep people out of the, out of the burn zone. So if anyone's not tracking... Uh, 2023, there was a major fire disaster that occurred in Lahaina, which is a town on the west coast of the island of Maui in the state of Hawaii, right? And it was one of those big, nasty fires, right? It destroyed something like 2,000 buildings. It killed over 100 people in an afternoon. Uh, pretty wild. And... Anytime we talk about, you know, an individual case study, we always have to disclaim we weren't there. I'm not a local. I'm not a firefighter. And we're never trying to criticize or blame anybody uh, or any one entity. But there was definitely a chain of events. And I think it's worth understanding. And I think one of the reasons it's worth understanding is this can happen other places. And it has happened other places. And the thing about the chain of events and when we say we're not being critical, one of the things about it is it, it is different. You're on an island. The, True. The problem with natural disasters on an island is you're on a goddamn island. Like it is different. And so it's for the sake of, you know, not being critical. It's not to talk any, any trash about how it was handled. It's just, it changes your perspective of things. And one of the, when we did a, uh, debrief on the Las Vegas Mandalay Bay shooting. One of the things that Will Hudler, who was the SWAT commander, the lieutenant on the ground, he works for Brink now, who we've worked with in the past. One of the things he talked about is how Las Vegas is kind of this island in the desert. 
right? No one is coming. It's up to us. Like mutual aid is very, very far away. But even there, it might be hours and hours and hours away, but there is still mutual aid that can drive to you. On Maui, I mean, yeah, you got help maybe coming from the other islands, but you're in the middle of the Pacific. Like the resources are very limited and it does change the perspective. And so I think that's by itself just worth considering. For sure. And as we're going to get into, the geography was absolutely a factor in how this how this went. So we also have to disclaim, you know, we're not trying to throw spears when we when we do a debrief like this and after action review. And there are very critical lessons we need to take from it. So with this disaster, on one hand, you know, sometimes you just get this perfect confluence of unlikely events, the black the black swan type event. You know, shit happens. And there was absolutely some of that here. There was just that almost literally a perfect storm of nasty circumstances that kind of compounded, right? The big one was lots of strong, gusty winds and dry air. And that was driven by a high pressure system to the north and Hurricane Dora, I think it was, to the south. And it got this weather effect with like crazy winds. Now, for a sense of kind of the conditions they were getting, steady state wind was reported at 40 miles an hour. So like a typical day in Clovis, New Mexico. (laughs) But it was gusting up to 82 miles an hour. Uh, And that's that's intense, right? That's hurricane tornado type winds. That's 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 pretty, pretty severe. On the other hand, we don't get to throw our hands up and let disasters take the wheel. Right. That's a recurring theme on tactical tangents is we don't ever get to do that. We have to take control even when the environment is fighting us. Uh, so when I say chain of events, right, there's a chain of warning signs that we collectively, America, should have seen and should have acted upon. And when I say isolated, you know, th- this type of event Yes, they were geographically isolated, intensely geographically isolated, but we've actually seen similar disasters occur even in places like California, what we don't typically think of as real isolated, although there are very isolated pockets in California. Uh, specifically, there is the Camp Fire, not to be confused with the Camp Fire, <laughs> uh, the Camp Fire, which burned down the town of Paradise, California, and very similar situation, very similar outcome. Fast moving fire took down the whole town. When it comes to chain of events, and we're talking about decision making and like Jim said, not throwing our hands up and saying like, let the disaster take the wheel, right? We're trying to gain initiative. And so there's a saying that it's not the plan, it's the planning. A lot of times it's just having those conversations and understanding all the possible iterations and contingencies that can happen a lot of times, if you look at a chain of events like this, it's there's an incremental component to it, right? So like you have the high pressure side, high pressure system that's building up, you've got the hurricane going on and it's recognizing like, all right, well, there's, there's, a, there's a tick on the radar. Oh, there's another, there's another thing, right? Another thing on the timeline. And at some point you have to break the cycle. And that's what gaining initiative, which is a very tactical concept, right? Gaining initiative is a big deal. We've talked about operational momentum before, where like we just kind of let the situation and our initial um, momentum going into that just kind of like, well, we got to just roll with it. Like we've got that going. And so let's just keep going. At some point, you have to think like, maybe I need to take my foot off the gas or maybe I need to hit the brakes. Maybe I need to steer a different direction. Like Jim said, sometimes shit happens, and that is a very real thing. But when it comes to anything tactical and a natural disaster can can play into this as well, the idea is you need to build adaptability and flexibility into your capabilities. That's a lot of abilities. (laughs) But it's absolutely true, though. (laughs) That's part of abilities, right? Flexibility, adaptability. Truility, yes. Capabilities, right? Like, you have to build that into it. It's not just about, you know, being the fastest or the strongest or the mightiest. It's about being able to switch gears and understand that, like, I've got to be able to take control of this thing. Like, we are 
often very reactive. Public safety, emergency response, like emergency services, all of that, disaster relief, it's very reactive in nature. That's part of it. So the concept of initiative is about recognizing that we are reactive and, and also recognizing those opportunities, right? Not being passive about it, being actively looking for those opportunities to legitimately grab the bull by the horns and to start steering the chain of events instead of just responding to them. I like that. So to kind of set the scene, uh, for those who haven't been to Maui or haven't been to Maui recently, I want you to picture, you know, a thousand miles of ocean in every direction, a thousand miles plus. Uh, you got this little archipelago, little chain of islands, right? The big island of Hawaii, um, Maui, Oahu, um, I'm going to mess up the rest of the islands, forgive me. <laughs> and for the most part, each of the bigger islands is a county. And that's worth understanding as far as like the organizational structure of these islands. Um, and it's changed a lot uh, over the years, right? Originally, it was a volcanic island, and it still is obviously a volcanic island in this Hawaiian archipelago, this chain of islands. With incredibly unique plant and animal species that don't have a lot of evolutionary reason to compete well with invasive plant and animal species, which is a big issue for the landscape. Uh, and then at some point a long time ago, Polynesian settlers arrived, uh, which I can only describe as incredibly badass in their seafaring capabilities, right? These guys and gals got on rafts somewhere around maybe Tahiti, Indonesia, I don't know, and like sailed the ocean without any GPS, without a steam, without nuclear power plants, whatever, and made it all the way to Hawaii, this incredibly remote island chain, and set up shop. And they're now what, what I would call Native Hawaiians, right? Native American Hawaiians. Uh, and then at some point, Western explorers and settlers showed up, <laughs> Captain Cook and, and, and crew, <laughs> and brought with them a lot of things. Some things good, some things bad. And everyone has their own like perspective and narrative about that. And that is an important part of this story, right? Uh, and so since then... For most of the last, say, 100, 150 years, Maui, among the islands, was predominantly the farming island. It was the agricultural island, right? And when you think of, like, pineapples and sugar cane, you know, C&H, California and Hawaii sugar, uh, that came from Maui, largely. Um, and so a lot of its modern history is how they've, like, moved water around the island from the wet parts to the dry, low flatland that's better for farming. And if you go to, like, the museums there, you will learn about that. Because uh, that's what I do when I go on trips. I, I nerd out at their museums. So, uh, the dry, low flatland in between the two main mountains um, is really, truly kind of a desert. It looks deserty as you drive across it, which is kind of unusual for you know, how most mainlanders would think of Hawaii, Hawaii and the Hawaiian islands. Um, and to the extent that it's green, it's green because they have moved water to it from the mountains where it does rain. Uh, and then at some point the resorts showed up and the tourists showed up and people like me showed up and I'm looking for Mai Tais and pina coladas <laughs> and beaches and, and, uh, um, screwing up, you know, trying to take a picture of the rainbow while I'm driving and irritating the locals, right? That's my role in this uh, ecosystem. Um, and also <laughs> labor organized. You know, a lot of the, the history of Hawaii is, is immigrant laborers who came often from Japan and places like Japan to work in the sugar fields and the pineapple fields. Um, and they got more and more organized, which changed how they had to be paid and treated by the companies. Uh, and along those lines, the value of land shot up more real estate got developed. And one of the things here, when I talk about Lahaina, which is again, a town on the West coast of, of Maui. Um, when I say wildfire, understand that yes, there are fields, empty fields around it, but most of the disaster was a neighborhood. It was several neighborhoods in a city 
like down the middle of the city of Lahaina. Uh, and um, although it was ignited by a brush fire on the edge of town. So uh, with those houses, as the real estate got developed, uh, most of the houses that burned in Lahaina were built in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. And this is also kind of significant. So like those houses were kind of modern in one sense, like they weren't ancient houses, um, but they weren't modern enough to have the most current fire resistant structures, right? There's a way you build a house in 2024 that makes it tough to burn that we didn't necessarily do in 1985. Um, and that plays into which houses burn and which houses didn't. The nicer, newer construction houses uh, often fared better. They also tended to have things like gardeners tending to the vegetation around them. Uh, so with all that development of the, the island of Maui, that also drove an economic shift ultimately away from agriculture. There's still some agriculture. You'll still see some farms and fields and stuff, but it's not nearly what it used to be. In 2016, the sugarcane processing operation shut down on Maui. It's literally like a museum now. Uh, so you still see ag in, on the island, but it's not nearly what it used to be, which also changes the labor force and heavy equipment that you might need to fight wildfires. It changes the water infrastructure you might need for water uh, for wildfires. Not only that, but if, if you understand the way just, I guess, uh, I don't know, time distance, just, just the size of like an Island, right. And, and how things are spaced out. Like Lahaina itself is, is a small ish, by by normal standards, tourist town, right? So like you can have a lot of like farming and agriculture in in the middle of the island, but those beaches tend to attract a lot a lot of people, right? So you're talking about a very concentrated gap, right, uh, or space yes, where absolutely. people kind of congregate, and the housing and all the economy stuff, like right, like the markets and the restaurants and the resorts, all that stuff is just concentrated on this little strip. If you look at Lahaina on a map, you'll see that it's very much laid out like along the beach. <laughs> it's yes. one of those towns. Yeah. And so like when, when it's set up that way in this kind of scenario, you run into problems. Yeah. So why I'm talking about all the farming and ag stuff, among other things is the change in economics drove a change in the climate of Maui. Gasp, climate. Oh, my God. I know climate's a controversy, and some people believe in it, some people they don't. That's fine. Whether you believe in climate change or not, I will tell you, climate change believes in you. <laughs> so, first off, there's just basic data. We know with very high confidence the temperature, the humidity, and the rainfall patterns on that island have changed in the last several decades. It's measurable. It's observable. It's repeatable. Like, we can... Yeah. Uh, we can see and, it. <laughs> and why is that happening? I don't know. I don't care. Maybe Santa's making it happen. It doesn't matter, <laughs> right? What I do know is the weather has changed and the climate has changed. Second, the microclimate, the area right around Lahaina, has also changed. Uh, first off, land that used to be irrigated is now not really getting irrigated, again, with the ag stuff. And Maui has an invasive dry grass. It's actually several different types of dry grass um, growing around the island. People planted it because it was pretty, I guess, about 100 years ago. And it was good, like, animal feed for goats and cows, whatever it is you grow. Um, but nowadays, it is mostly fine, flammable fuel. And it is out-competing a lot of the native plants. You also have houses where there didn't used to be houses and you get houses that don't have defensible space around them. And it's easy to tell people, Hey, you need 200 feet of cleared space around your house. It's really hard to actually do. Um, so that is one of the tricky, tricky challenges here. Yeah. So about the space between houses. Now I'm not a firefighter, obviously, <laughs> but See that on fire? We put the water, <laughs> put water on the fire. On the fire. Um, houses and just 
structures, right? Like human occupation, I would say, in this day and age, present their own fire challenges separate from like wildland stuff. All the paint that we use and the plastics and the polyester, the filling in your beds and your couches, like that shit burns different than wood and grass. And when I say different, what I mean is hotter. And it's putting out a lot of other shit too, which is also not good for you. But it means that when those things catch fire, those structures themselves become their own challenges. Not be, not just because it's a structure, it's more complex. It's contained with walls and stuff. And so it really gets to kind of uh, superheat, right? The, the box itself gets really, really Picture hot. Picture like a, a charcoal briquette starter, right? It's a chimney, it sucks the air in and then up. Yeah. Kind of thing, right? Yeah. And so, like, you get this entire giant box that gets super hot and super heated. And all that heat that it puts out makes all the shit around it a lot easier to kick off, right? And, and like, so when, when you've got, like, one structure that goes off and there's another one right next to it, it's – with all that heat that's coming out, it's a lot easier for those things to it, – it starts like this chain of events, so that space in between becomes a, a bigger deal. And in a wildfire situation, this becomes a challenge because you're not just trying to – it's like on a house fire in a city, in a metropolitan area, like you want to protect that house, like, like put the fire out, right? But also defend the structures around it. But wildfires, when those start to get really big and out of control, it's also about containment. It's not necessarily about just like that one house or like a couple of structures, but those things get so hot and they can start to burn so quick and for so long, like it takes a long time for a house, even to put a house fire out. You'll have guys on the scene for hours afterwards trying to prevent that thing from rekindling. So it puts everything around it at more risk. And it's a lot, it makes it a lot harder to just like cut bait and, and push your fire line out because this isn't just a, a, a forest fire. It's not just about like, oh, well, this this hill is going to burn right here. Like those are people's homes. And so we go out of our way to try to protect those structures and put the fires out. And so like you're, you're going to get in a lot tighter, right, to, around those areas. And that, that presents a lot more risk. So like mixing the wildfire problem in with a bunch of houses catching on fire, structures on fire, like – that gets that gets real challenging because you're trying to balance the interest of protecting these these homes and the people that might be inside them if you haven't done the evacuations or if people haven't evacuated and also trying to on the wildland side of it contain the fire and prevent it from becoming a bigger problem right like that's harder that's easier said than done so this brings up a lot of really important sub points here one is how much water does it take to put out like a house fire I don't know, quite a bit. <laughs> How much water does it take to put out a thousand houses on fire? The answer is more than you got. More than the island had available to pump into the hydrants to to spray. And also when you talk wildfire, like water doesn't really do it. In, in, in a brush fire or a forest fire situation, you don't put it out with water. You put it out with isolation, right? Backfires and... Eliminate uh, the fuel. Yeah, and uh, and um, fire breaks, especially right? in areas with a lot of moisture and humidity, where like it, at the point that it's starting to really really burn, it's got to be hot enough that in spite of that humidity, right, like it's still going to burn. <laughs> like yeah. just putting more water on it just creates steam. It doesn't necessarily put it out. Yeah, and and often fires will get they're they're real insidious, right? It can get, get down into roots. It can get underneath um, debris. So you can put water on top of it all you want, and unless you're like flooding it, you're not really going to get there. And that also plays into the timeline of the fires that day. So when you get into the details of the 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 real timeline of the Lahaina fire, it was actually two fires. It was more than that, truly. But there was an initial fire, a morning fire. And then there was an afternoon fire with basically the same start point. So what had happened was... What had happened uh, a, was... A power line went down, ignites the vegetation around it, fire department goes out, sprays it down, keeps spraying it down, keeps watching it because they know it's real windy and real dry. And so they stay there for hours 
watching it and spraying it and watching it and spraying it. And finally, they, they're like, this is as contained as we're going to get. It's not extinguished. It's contained. That's an important distinction, right? And they like went back to the fire station to rest, refit, because they knew they were going to have a long day. And then sure enough, the alarms went off again. The fire was up and now it was moving. And also consider if a fire is moving at 40 to 80 miles an hour, how fast does a fully laden fire truck go? Like a fire truck. A fire truck. And you probably or need all the, more. You, probably need- you, could, you, you could have 10 fire trucks. You don't have 10 fire trucks, but if you did... <laughs> Right in the village of Lahaina, how many fire trucks did they have? It was it was, it was on the not island. All. Yeah, how many fire? And this is like what I was saying earlier. Like, yeah, you could get resources from the other islands potentially, but but like moving a fire truck across the water is not exactly like easy. I yeah, mean, it can be. I it can be done coming in from, a couple of days or a week. Oh yeah, right? no, it, but, it yeah. absolutely. But coming from like. Jim and I grew up in Southern California, like wildfires were our thing, <laughs> you know, in Southern California. And you would see, and, and I know guys that work in California as firefighters that have gone to help with other wildland things, like those strike teams would go from all over. I mean, we, I remember sending people out to uh, strike teams out halfway or more across the country for wildfire stuff. Yeah. And it would be a several, like a couple days trip, but it's not as simple to move fire engines across island to island. Like it's just not that simple. So how many fire engines and water tenders and whatever else wildland crews are there on the island? Like, and, and also I want to paint the picture in your head of a fast moving fire. Cause this was absolutely a fast moving fire, right? It was moving in some cases, 40 to 80 miles an hour. Um, I used to work a big bombing range in eastern New Mexico that was very dry, and we we had high winds, and we'd have issues on the bombing range where it would catch fire because we dropped bombs on it, and um, a tumbleweed would catch fire, and it would blow fire at 50 miles an hour down the road, and literally, like, we were chasing the burning tumbleweeds in some <laughs> cases. There were instances where jackrabbits would catch fire and they would run to get away from themselves on fire. I picture Jim like yelling at a bunch of little airmen with like a fire Stop extinguisher. That tumbleweed. Like, go get it. <laughs> it well, and a, a lot like, of learning. On like a side by side. Like <laughs> a, a lot of learning occurred where I'd talk to the fire truck fires out there and I'd be like, Hey, do you have enough water? And they're like, Jim, sir, uh, water doesn't help out here. Uh, if you fart out here, the, the range will catch fire. And second, <laughs> uh, that's not how we fight wildfires. We fight them by isolation, right? So a little bit of tangent, but I think important, right? Fast moving fire is a different animal than a lot of us are used to thinking when we think about like a house that's on fire, right? And also water, when your whole water system collapses, um, the fact that you're near a hydrant doesn't help if nothing's coming out of that hydrant, okay? So... All of this, like, shift in how Maui exists and the demographics and economics and climate of the island, uh, what it means for us is the situation changed faster than the planning and the infrastructure and the emergency services could keep up, both in a strategic long-term sense and in a tactical sense that day. The fire danger, which... When I say danger, think ORM, operational risk management, right? The risk, the probability and the severity of a wildfire went way up over the years. But the preparedness level of the island didn't appreciably change. And that's probably unfair. Like, I'm sure some people were fighting to make it better. I'm sure they were making some improvements. But the proof is in the pudding. And what we see in 2023 with the Lahaina disaster was it was too little, too late. Yeah, and I, I'm, like, very cautious to, like, pass judgment on any of this. And I certainly don't want this to sound like I'm talking any shit, but, like, the level of preparedness, I, I don't want to call anybody complacent because I don't know, right? Like, I, I don't know 
like Jim said, there there were probably people who spent a career, you know, like saying, "Hey, we need to do this, that, and the other thing," and and we're we're fighting the good fights and all of that. Yeah, it's great. And if that person also brings fifty million dollars to the table, they can actually execute what they want, right? Right. And that's the thing is, I don't I don't want to throw shade because it, it is a different problem, you know. But I do think it is worth considering that there there might be a cultural component to this. And I'm just saying this anecdotally <laughs> from my experience. Like if you've never been to Hawaii or some tropical place, like a touristy tropical place, there is a different kind of mindset and outlook on life. Like that's <laughs> – I've experienced that in the in, in, when I go there. And granted, I haven't lived there, so I don't know if that persists outside of just like the resort mentality. Um, but I, I had a friend that lived on Oahu for a while. And I went and visited him one time. And we're hanging out and like, we were doing something, customer service related or so, maybe driving in traffic. I don't remember what it was, but like someone, someone somewhere, I don't even remember what it was at this point, it was like moving really slow, like taking forever, doing whatever it was they were doing. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't mean to be impatient, but like, like I, I know I'm on vacation, but Jesus, can we like <laughs> hurry this up? And he's like, nah, dude, you're on island time. Like You got to understand you're on island time now. And the thing about him saying that and having spent some time in places like this is like, there really is a whole vibe and lifestyle that comes with living on an Island <laughs> and, or and a least, lot of that's by necessity, right? Like it doesn't do you any good to freak out about everything. Well, you're sure. on an Island. Sure. And also it's part of the appeal, right? It's part of what makes yeah. it like why we want to go there for sure. But I could imagine how that kind of mentality could play a role in this sort of stuff. Like I, one time I went to Jamaica and <laughs> I was, we went on uh, everything on Jamaica is like, no problem, man. You know, everything's no problem, man. Yeah, cool. So we went on a like little excursion uh, up in the jungle and in, into some mountain mountainous jungle area. And we were driving this little shitty shuttle bus thing and the driving like we're on like the edge of a cliff and this dude it was getting a little squirrely it was a little a little bit sketchy <laughs> and i remember this driver after it got like a little sketchy at one point he's like it's no problem and i'm like yeah it might be a real big fucking problem actually <laughs> like <laughs> this this could be real real bad as it happens um so, like, I love the mentality. I love the cultural aspect of going to those places. Unless or until, of course, there actually is a problem. And so <laughs> we have to, like, again, I'm not saying that to be critical because I've never lived in those places. Like, I don't – maybe those conversations do happen. Like, I'm not throwing shade. But I, I do think there is a cultural difference between living in a place like this Versus not like I mentioned earlier, the problem with fighting a fire on an island is you're on a goddamn island. And so hopefully, and I don't know, so I'm not, again, it's not a criticism of this event because I'm sure there were people thinking about it, but hopefully there are people thinking about those unique challenges presented in a scenario like this. Yeah. Uh, and one thing I want to really key in on is the insidious shift in risk is really tough because our little eight brains, it's hard for us to process like changes in risk and picture like the boiling the frogs kind of scenario, right? Yeah, it's, it's incremental, right? Like that's yeah. the thing about like the gaining initiative thing I said earlier is it's incremental. And at what point do you have the opportunity to like seize the moment and grab the bull by the horns? That's, that's the insidious part, right? It's, yeah. It creeps up on you. So how much is too much? How much dry grass is too much dry grass around your property? Uh, how much wind is too much wind where you shut off the electrical power in the city? Um, how much overall very tough to quantify fire risk do you accept before you pay for and build a new fire station or add aero firefighting capabilities um, or bring in 
contracted aerial firefighting capabilities, which are exceptionally expensive. Air is expensive, but it is a big deal when you're trying to isolate a fire, right? Um, especially when upgrading your preparations might require a big step change in investment. You know, it's one thing we're talking $5,000, $10,000. It's another thing we're talking like $5 million or $50 million or $500 million. Yeah, this is like a common, I mean, I think about working for a municipal police department and just city budgets in a regular city, right? Like, hey, we need new police cars. Our cars are breaking down, like... Well, that money's got to come from like the parks and rec department, right? Or the mm-hmm. streets department where they're filling all the potholes. And most people, and th- this is this is important from a public safety perspective, right? Most people in their day-to-day lives don't have to call the cops, don't have to call the fire department or EMS or whatever, right? Most people, most of the time, don't have to call for those services. When they do, they need it really, really bad. But most of the time, they don't have to. So filling the potholes in the street seems like a much bigger deal. Having parks to take your kids every day after school seems like a bigger deal. So in a place like this, where, again, like part of it's cultural, but also economic, The touristy stuff, like making this place a nice place to visit, that's a big part of their economy. That's also how you get the tax revenue that pays for everything Everything else, else, right? Yeah, absolutely, right? But that's the thing is it's like the the self-licking ice cream cone part of that is making it nice so people want to come there is what pays for everything. And so how do you like – how do you not build that resort so that we can have another fire station? Right. Like that's it's a it's there's some salesmen. It's easy to be like, well, we really need this fire station, so we're not going to do X. And people are like, when's the last time we had a fire? Right. (laughs) You know, it's easy to say shit like that. Yeah. Because they're not seeing it through that lens of risk. We got away with it last time there was a fire. Yeah. The fire fire department did great. They're great guys. It's great. Right. Yeah. Um, And I didn't appreciate how expensive one fire truck is until I tried to buy one. So again, I used to run a bombing range and we had a big fire danger problem. And I went through this. I said, Hey, we, our risk situation has changed. We're doing a lot more incendiary work on this dry prairie. We need more fire trucks. And they said, Jim, it costs about as much to buy a new airplane as it costs to buy a fire truck. And it's an an ongoing cost, right? Because you got to staff it. Yep. And so do you want us as an air force to have an airplane or do you want us to have a fire truck? And I said, well, dang, I care about airplanes, don't I? And and it's hard, like when you look at it from a staffing perspective, because we sort of talked about this when it came to strategy, our our episode we did on strategy, we talked about how many ambulances do you have, right? Or, or police cars on the road. And if you don't need them very often, it's easy to say, well, I'm paying these guys to literally sit at their station and do nothing for X yeah. hours a week. If I'm cutting the fat to, to cut a budget, right. that's like, the first like, thing I'm going to cut, right? Like I'm spending X amount of money to pay these people to just sit around and do nothing for the, for the one in whatever chance that this other thing happens. And that's the problem is like, yep. it's like a dumb and dumber when he's like, what are the chances? Like one in a million? Like like one in a hundred? So no, like more like one chance. in a million. So you're saying there's a chance. That's right. Right? Like there is a chance. That's the thing. Yeah. So it's not fire the truck? odds, it's the stakes. 100%. So fire truck, very expensive. Whole fire station and crew is really, really expensive. A dozen or more of those in a space as small as in a Hawaiian island, that is really expensive, right? A land costs money there. Um, the operational art and the operational risk management, ORM art, is knowing when to ring the alarm bell, when to say, hey, we have a problem, we need to do something about it. And that is tricky business because nobody wants to be wrong and you don't want to cry wolf and you don't want to say the sky is falling over climate change um 
On the other hand, when that event happens, you have every day from today till your big disaster to do your prep for it. Uh, So let's say you're the mayor of Lahaina or you're the Maui County fire chief or the head of the Maui emergency management agency. And you get a briefing on this fire danger thing is rising or more likely just on your way to work. You notice a lot of Brown grass along the side of the road and in between houses. Cause in real life, that's how it goes, right? What do you do about it? Do you post on Facebook about it? Hey guys, I noticed the, the fire danger is high today. Well, we, we do that, right? The National Weather Service puts stuff out. The Forestry Department puts stuff out. Um, do you issue some kind of a directive telling people to like mow? Well, you can. There's city ordinances all over the place. It doesn't mean people follow them. Um, are you going to send government crews and government resources door to door to work on this problem? Say you run the power company, which took a lot of flack over how the fires ignited. At what point do you shut off the power? Because one person ultimately has to make that decision. Do I do I throw the breaker or not, right? Um, what's the cost if you're wrong on that? What are the risks when you do shut off the power? Because now you're screwing up all the traffic lights. You're screwing up, you know, sometimes critical equipment. Uh, critical commerce and infrastructure. The Wi-Fi at the resorts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was in Mexico one time and the power went out at a resort and all of the plumbing was also tied to the power, which meant we couldn't flush toilets. We couldn't use the showers. We couldn't go in the pool. The bars were shut down. <laughs> and and I understand that like when it comes to – uh life and property safety, like kind of thing. You might have to make that call, but it's, that's not a zero set. Like it's not without expense that that call comes with. Yep. So fire, this fire kicks off and it spreads very fast. And there were some problems getting the notification out to the people of Lahaina, which is, I think the, probably primary causal factor to the number of casualties. Hawaii famously has a very extensive siren based alarm system. They have stacks of air raid sirens all over the islands uh, set up mostly for tsunamis and also literal air raids. Um, They were silent that day. Effectively like one or two people heard them somewhere on the island, but like they were not activated. Um, The fire took out electrical and telecommunication nodes for a big chunk of the area pretty quickly. Uh, And the winds took down the electrical nodes for a big chunk of the area before the fire even really got going. The county did use social media posts uh, and uh, push notifications over cell phone uh, to alert victims of the fire. And both of those were really problematic. The, Social media posts were kind of disjointed. It was tough to understand what was happening, where it was happening, what you were supposed to do with that information. And the cell pushes, very few people received them. When they did receive them, they got them late, too late to do any good. And they didn't tell people anything useful about how to escape. They would just say, evacuate this neighborhood. And they would identify the neighborhood by like a block number. Um, very few people outside of emergency management probably know, know their the fuck that address is. by block number. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> so there have been a lot of questions about why the sirens weren't used. Um, one reason officials gave was that since those sirens were meant for tsunamis and when there is a tsunami, you go uphill, like up away from the beach. Uh, they were worried people were going to scramble up away from the beach toward the fire. Okay. okay I can kind of follow that. Maybe. Um, I don't like it. Uh, the fire happened in daylight. So most people could see it and most people could smell it. It's not like they needed to be told there was a fire. Um, what they needed was Where an evacuation smoke. route. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, there were clues. <laughs> and, and granted, like when you're inside a house and sometimes, you know, remember, you have a lot of people in a city. You have people with different ages, disabilities, mental, physical c- capacity. Um, so I'm not saying they didn't need to push a, a evacuation order out. They did. I'm saying the siren doesn't tell you which way to go. And that was the thing people really, really needed. They needed to hear go north now or go toward the water now or go south now. And they didn't get that. Uh, and kind of to step back from this disaster, consider notification and communication are like really, really critical tasks in a disaster. You have to alert people to the fact that there's a problem. You have to give them meaningful direction. You have to give them enough information to make their own prudent decisions. That's true in a building fire. That's true in an active shooter event. That was true in the COVID pandemic. And it's true in a wildfire. I think about that. Like if there's an active shooter in your school and the announcement on the overhead speakers is code red, code red, code red. That doesn't tell me anything. That tells me there's a problem. Okay, great. Uh, If they say lockdown, 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 that doesn't help me either. What, what, what's more useful? Hey, there's a guy with a gun on the west side of campus. He's moving east. He's wearing black over tan. That gives me something. That tells me whether running, hiding, or fighting is what I need to be doing right then. Right? And is that information going to be perfect? No. But it's better than lockdown, 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 or code red, code red, or you know, Mr. Jeeves in the building, whatever your code is. Um, plain language repeated language is what you really need. This is, uh, I, the other day there was an incident happening near a school and I, I happened to be out for training or something. And I heard an officer tell like the dispatchers, Hey, let whatever school know to go on lockdown. And I, I had this thought of like, Ah, uh, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, first of all, the incident that it was didn't necessarily pose like a giant risk to the school. There was like a theoretical risk, right? Um, and th- the panic involved of going to a school and being like locked down because I assume there's a notification to parents, right? There is a cost and a risk associated with right. pushing that information, right? Right. And and so there's like it's not something you want to do like willy-nilly, right? Like if there's not a real risk, if it's just like a well, but also you don't want to like not do it when it's when it's practical. But if I am the principal at that school and the police department calls and says Lock down, lock down right now. And then after the fact, I find out it's for some bullshit. That, that that becomes problematic. And so now I'm thinking like, well, when that call comes in, I'm going to start triaging that, you know, yeah. and, and like screening whether or not I'm going to lock down based on what they tell Well, what's happening? We can't yeah, tell you. Uh, well, adding just a couple of bytes of information to that makes a big difference. Yeah. Hey, we need you to lock down because there's a, we're serving a search warrant across the street. Right. Cool. That's different. Right. Like, okay, why don't we put, we can post some security people. Like we can, we can have a monitor, a yard monitor, go watch that side of the school. And if something happens, they have the radio, they can lock us down. Not, not the same thing. Right. And that's the issue. I think when it comes to th- this is a, a very basic communication thing is like conveying accurate and actionable information. Right. If you're vague and ambiguous, just lock down because I said so. Yeah. That yeah. doesn't have the full force and meaning of active shooter west side of campus. Yeah. Does less than no good. Right. And with surprising frequency, we fuck this up across the country, across the enterprise of emergency services. We fuck up notification and communication. Every critical incident after action review I've ever seen talks about communication as a problem. Every critical incident at a like, you know, criminal 
mass murder, mass violence event, uh, talks about communication from law enforcement out to everyone who's not law enforcement is a problem. This is a thing we've got to get right. Okay. Um, we don't invest enough time or money up front on notification infrastructure or in notifying the public on where to look for notification. And that's a, that's a nationwide issue. I get random Amber alerts for custodial disputes. You know, mom has custody and dad doesn't dad takes the kids. Uh, I get those Amber alerts from across the state. They blare on my phone at 120 decibels. <laughs> But when my city wants to tell me that a water main broke and it's contaminating my water supply, that comes through as a voice robo call that my phone identifies as probably spam. So I don't even answer it. That checks. Right. So the thing I can't do anything about the Amber alert in most cases, and it's usually three in the morning, I'm asleep in bed. Um, that comes through like a fire alarm. And the, hey, your drinking water might give you the shits for the next three weeks. That, that's a spam message. Okay. Um, and when the time to notify does come, officials tend to stall and stammer over whether and when to notify the public. And also how, like what do they actually say? That is idiotic and dangerous. This is the sort of thing you need to tabletop exercise. This is the sort of thing you need to sit down and work out some procedures for. And think through the secondary and tertiary unintended consequences of what you put out and what you don't put out. Yes, panic is a concern. But people get a lot more panicky if they think officials are withholding critical information and if they think they're being lied to. So don't do those things. There's a great book called The Unthinkable by Amanda Ripley, and she does an excellent job explaining when and how people actually get panicky. And it's not usually what officials tend to think. Um, I'm a big, big believer in the saying, credibility is the currency of leadership. Uh, and a crisis is when you might need to cash in a whole lot of that currency. So you got to build up that credibility up front before the disaster. Yeah. I overheard a conversation the other day from someone in the leadership position at work. And it had to do with like an ever changing. There's a set of changes that is occurring within my agency that like no one knows how it's actually going to shake out. There's just a whole lot of hypothesis and guessing. And he was speaking to the challenge of like, well, do I share the information that I have, which is arguably like rumor, messy and it's messy, hypothesis, right? yeah, and then look like a fool when I'm wrong. Like, or do I withhold and let my guys know that I'm withholding stuff from them? Like, what is the better option? And like, in an emergency management setting, like panic is the concern, right? If you say lock down the school, there's an active shooter, and there isn't, you created a whole bunch of drama, right? Or you sound the air raid sirens or the fucking tornado alarm or whatever the fuck, like whatever it is, right? If you do those things, and they lose the credibility, that's problematic. But if you have some suspicion or hypothesis and you don't, there's a cost with that as well. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that, there's the, but, but that is absolutely a leadership challenge, 100%. And I want you to be thinking about that before the crisis. Uh, speaking of before the crisis, when you're on the receiving end of those notifications, do you, dear listener, know how your employer, your school, your city, your county, your state, uh, the national emergency services, how will they pass critical information to you? Uh, and odds are good. Each one of those has a different way of passing critical information to you. Is there some AM radio station you're supposed to tune to? How do you know to tune to it? Will Netflix 
because nobody watches real TV anymore, is it going to tell you if there's a tornado coming? Back in the day, that's how people found out was they turn on the TV and then, you know, it'd have like a banner across the bottom. Uh, do you need to download an app? Do you need to subscribe to a service like Nixley or Rave? Have you ever even heard of Nixley or Rave? <laughs> I, I have a story about this, actually. Send it. I, so my kid started preschool and the school's like, oh, we have this app you should download. Oh, it's, good. It's how we communicate with you. And I'm like, fine. And in the beginning I of have the sc- five apps for my kids. School. Uh-huh. Five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the beginning of the school year, it was it was great because like throughout the week, I'd see like random pictures of him like painting or playing with friends. And I was like, oh, this is kind of nice. You know, by the end of the school year, all I ever saw in that thing was like PTO fundraisers. And it was like constantly like I I was like, what happened to all the cute pictures of my kid like painting or doing whatever arts and crafts like bullshit like. Like this became like, you're spamming me with your fundraisers and stuff. And like, that's problematic because like now I've started to ignore those notifications. And if they tell me something's happening at school, like now it's a 50, 50 chance that I'm going to actually read the thing. Cause like usually I ignore it, ignore it. So. Yep. Uh, and this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Cities and agencies are bouncing from, some apps and services to other apps and services based on like contracts expiring, that kind of thing. And my experience is they tend to leave citizens kind of in the blind that they need to go find another app. So that's not unique to Maui. That is nationwide international. As far as I know, like the onus is on you to go figure out how you're going to get emergency notifications. And if you don't know, you got to find out, like go press your city officials, your County officials, your state officials, and if they don't know, that's a clue. <laughs> uh, so speaking of these uh, critical notification systems, <clears throat> Hawaii actually has kind of an interesting history with this. You know, I, I told you that Hawaii has air raid sirens like all over the place. In January of 2018, so a couple of years ago, Hawaii statewide accidentally pushed the following message to every cell phone in the state. It said emergency alert, push nose, like an amber alert, right? Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. All caps. Oh boy. I remember this. This is a good one. So you get that and you're like, oh, this has got to be a drill. <laughs> this has got to be something. So you turn on the TV. <laughs> there were TV interruptions on CBS and NBC that said, and I quote, the U.S. Pacific Command has detected a missile threat to Hawaii. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. This is not a drill. If you're indoors, stay indoors. If you're outdoors, seek immediate shelter in a building. Remain indoors well away from windows. If you're driving, pull safely to the side of the road and seek shelter in a building or lay on the floor. We will announce when the threat has ended. This is not a drill. Take immediate action measures. Holy fuck. Yeah. I remember okay. this. This is Yeah, this, this is, is when Hawaii got nuked, right? Yeah. So basically, that is that is that's what it's going to sound like when the ICBMs are inbound, okay? And what is it telling you? It's telling you to put your head between your knees and kiss your ass goodbye. This so, is like I like such a big deal. I I'm very <laughs> curious how people responded to this like if I got that message, right? Oh yeah. And then like <laughs> Now, if I ever get that message again, because that's like a once in, like that doesn't happen. Often. Ah, it, it it does happen, and it has happened in several other places. It turns out. Well, okay, the reason fair, fair the but, reason this particular one happened was the state emergency management guys were running a drill, and the guy running the drill for the state office said exercise, 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 and then read off a script that said, this is not a drill. So one of the underlings heard this is not a drill and then sent it out like it was real. And as far as we know, that underling believed it was real when he pushed it and then they couldn't figure out how to recall it. (laughs) Uh, So 
What's the lesson from that? Well, at least we know the Hawaii State Office of Emergency Services can send push notifications across the cell network. They just kind of didn't the day of the Maui fire. So why didn't they? I don't know, and it's probably going to take a while to figure all that out. Uh, there are some claims that they did try to push uh, notifications, and the cell network just failed. It entirely possible the cell towers were on fire. Could have happened. Or... Uh, didn't have power because the um, power lines went down. There should be backups, but apparently there weren't. There were some notifications, things like uh, uh, 719 on August 8th over Twitter. Uh, Maui Emergency Services said evacuation order on Maui for Kula 200 subdivision off uh, Auli'i Drive, which I don't think that's actually in Lahaina. I think that's in a different town. Uh, due to a brush fire, grab your go kits and evacuate your family and pets now. That's good. What does it not tell you? Which way to go from that neighborhood? Go east, west, north, south. Get on this road. It doesn't have a route, right? Or a suggested route. Um, they pushed other things through Twitter, through Facebook. Um, the kind of the, the running theme with it is it was too little, too late. So as a informed citizen, you might call yourself a prepper. Um, you need to understand what this means for you on the receiving end. You may not get timely notification for lots of reasons. Partly the loss of electricity and cell network. Those are like the first things that happen in most disasters is the loss of electricity and the cell network. So your notification and communications need a redundant mechanism. And that whether you're on the receiving end or the sending end of that, you, you need something that's going to work. As a, as a prepper, know that you might get incomplete, conflicting, or misleading guidance. That is a recurring theme through disasters throughout history. You need to put some effort into what I would call intel, right? Your efforts to build situational awareness and recognize that there may be more disaster than you're being told. Not because of some dastardly conspiracy, but because the authorities may not know what all's going on. Uh, you might need to find, download, sign up for emergency notification messages from several different sources. Uh, I, some people really love social media. Some people really hate it. But social media often is where you're going to find out anything. So you need to have something. Um, if you're getting push texts or robocalls. That's fine, but you need to save those numbers in your phone as, like, not spam. And you'd be surprised how often they come up as spam because of robocalls. And also understand, like, fog and friction is a huge deal in disasters. Fog is the drop in situational awareness. Friction is the rise in Murphy and snafus in a disaster. The wind was so bad that most of the air units, the air capacity of the emergency services guys either had to stay on the ground or they had to return early. They were out earlier in the day. And when it got really severe, they had to go home that reduced the overall situational awareness of the decision makers. Just as an example, the mayor didn't know the full scale of this fire until like the day after, right? When the winds died down and they launched civil air patrol to go do a reconnaissance flight. And that was about the same time the casualty numbers started coming in. And you can imagine like, yeah, they knew it was bad. And then they just, you know, the numbers kept trickling in. It was getting worse and worse and worse, right? So that was the notification communication piece of it. I would say causal factor one of why it was such a severe disaster. Causal factor two, I would say, is the failure of the evacuation. So the information flow sucked as far as where to go. One of the reasons it sucked as far as where to go is down power lines. So big winds, they were knocking over power lines. It's one of the reasons the fires were starting was down power lines. And in several instances, there were reports that cops were turning cars around at the down power lines, even though in some cases, um, those power lines were like de-energized. The electricity was shut off to them. The cop, didn't necessarily know that at the time, 
right? So in some cases, they were literally turning people around back toward the fire. Now, it's a little more complicated than I make it sound. So let me kind of rephrase that. In this windstorm, in this town, with relatively few artery roads, where traffic flow was already kind of fragile, with trees and branches down across roads, power lines down, street lights down and out, traffic snarled. And it kind of went in circles in some places. That trapped people between the fire and the ocean, with the wind blowing the fire toward the ocean. Worst environment imaginable, right? Yeah, kind of a shit show. And the, the downed power lines thing, this is a, so like important for evacuations for sure, right? But it also does tie back to the communication component as well. So it's neat that the island can do push notifications out to everyone on the island, right? But one of the questions is like, how does the power company talk to the cops? And traditionally that was like, most communication centers has like phone calls, right? Like there, there's a, there's a line for that. But if I'm an officer and I see a down power line and I don't know, like with certainty, if that line is hot or not, like, I'm not trying to find out, <laughs> you know, like I'm not going to go mess with power lines. That's just not a thing that I'm going to do. Right. And I've watched the linemen show up at scenes where there's like down power lines and they'll walk right over with their little like gloves and little pole and they'll manhandle this stuff like it's no big deal because like someone at their headquarters was like able to tell them power was diverted like those lines are cold. And it always strikes me to see those people work because there's a lot of implicit trust and confidence that they have when it comes to dealing with that sort of thing. And also just their level of expertise in terms of determining how to safely handle power lines which is like a big deal that that uh, by itself, that's a job that just doesn't get enough credit on, on either end. The people diverting the power at the headquarters or the, the linemen that are out there dealing with it, right? They don't get enough credit to begin with. But that being said, you have to assume that in a situation like this, the power company has their hands full, right? And they, and they're not going to, they're not really used to working in these kind of conditions, the dynamic situations. Yeah. Right? The emergency situation in the way that public safety people might be. And what I kind of what I mean by that is they don't necessarily look at risk the same way, right? Like in a, in a hasty or time compressed way, procedurally, your power company workers are going to be very, very like exceptionally safe and very risk averse, very cautious and they're probably not going to be real comfortable in like a pinch to go like tell the cops like, yeah, man, those, those lines are cold. Let's just drag them out of the way and let people go by. Right. Like, no, nah. <laughs> they're going to they're going to be very by the book about it. And a situation like this is kind of unconventional. Right. Because it's like they, they have their hands full. They're busy and they're not. They don't calculate risk. They don't look at this kind of problem in terms of competing priorities in their mind an energized power line that's down is like the big, the big deal. Right. But if I'm trying to mitigate the downed power lines, but I also don't want to send people back to the fire, there's a balance between those two things. And maybe one comes at the expense of the other. And that's, yeah, and that's the sort of thinking that they're probably not used to. Yeah, and we have the benefit of hindsight, right? We can look back and we see this disaster happening, this chain of events where the power lines were down, trapping people, cops were focusing on the power lines versus the fires and prioritized one or the other. Who in a disaster is responsible for putting those puzzle pieces together? Right. Right. Well, well and, Do we and expect making those, making the risk decisions, right? Yeah. So the power company may not have understood that those power lines, specific power lines down, were blocking the exit routes, right? And if they did understand that, who do they tell that to? And how do they tell it? How do we get that information from one particular power guy to one particular fielded cop? And vice versa, how does that cop tell everyone, hey, this power line is blocking the exits. I need to do something about the power line, right? Well, and if your only job is... 
keep people away from energized power lines that are down. Or you're doing your only job. Let people pass on roads that are safe to pass. On both ends of that. Yep. There's a balance that you have to strike where you have to be like, all right. Neither one of these is great, but we have to make a call here, right? And, and, yeah. And, and do I and expect any... Whose shoulders does that fall on? Yeah. Do I expect any given fielded cop to be the person who makes that call? I don't I don't know that I can yeah. in a lot of cases, unless yeah. it's real obvious, right? And, and same to the individual lineman, right? Yeah. Like, So consider how this calculus, this calculation changes if you know how bad the fire is, and consider how it changes if you don't know how bad the fire is, right? If you can see a wall of flame coming at you, that might change how you look at that down power line. If you see smoke in the distance, but you don't yet know how fast it's moving towards you, uh, maybe you don't take that risk, right? So fog and friction, there's a lot you don't know. Uh, This is compounded by the fact the geography of Lahaina, right? At Lahaina is in this unique situation in terms of a, it's a beach town and in terms of its avenues of escape. It is a town with ocean to the west, mountain to the east, and you can only really get in and out to the north or to the south on like one, two, maybe three roads. Okay. Um, I don't expect every tourist to understand the escape routes. I don't even expect every local to understand that. But I sure as hell expect the emergency services to understand that. And if you're a prepared type, uh, you should be able to take one look at a map and notice that. Uh, And when you do look at maps of how the fire spread and moved, man, it looks a lot like an ambush. As a military guy looking at it, it looks like a linear ambush, okay? A sudden surprise attack against a moving or mobile target. These people were trapped in a kill zone. They couldn't escape. And the fire just kind of flanked them from uh, right to left, from east to west. So the fire came, it went, uh, like I said, destroyed some like 2,000 structures, killed uh, 100 plus people with people missing for days and weeks as they were trying to get accounted for. Uh, Nasty, nasty situation. Big disaster, big tragedy. Uh, But it was kind of an ongoing disaster because like... There are people who are still unhomed over this. Uh, One of the things that stood out right away after the disaster, after the day of, was how fast disinformation and misinformation spread about it. Now, uh, there are a couple things to take from that. One, there were some foreign actors probably doing it. There's probably Russians and Chinese and people like them uh, sowing discord in American life probably doing that right business yeah just just doing what they do bless their hearts Get, getting the okay. business you know uh but interestingly it probably wasn't all foreign actors doing it some of it was but some of it was domestic and might have been getting amplified or signal boosted by foreign actors giving it click traffic getting getting its engagement up but some of that was just pure domestic and it turns out there are just assholes on the internet um, so the disinformation started quickly. Like the fire was still literally hot when the misinformation, disinformation rumors and myths started circulating across the internet. And there was a confluence, I think, or a synergy between poor government communication and this disinformation, right? The information space hates a vacuum, And people didn't hear or didn't trust the government communication. And the government, likewise, wasn't hearing or paying enough attention to the rumors that were circulating among the people. And there are a bunch of reports or articles about this. NPR did a story about it. And they said, in the absence of clear, reliable information, the rumors grew and cast suspicion on emergency response efforts. They fed into people's fears that they wouldn't be able to keep their land or their homes if they remained leading some to return to their houses in the burn zone days after the fire, despite warnings from authorities that the air and the water wasn't safe and the structures may be compromised. 
So there was already some suspicion between the locals and the government, right? Dating back to the arrival of Westerners <laughs> to the Hawaiian Islands, there has been some suspicion there, right? I don't live on Maui. I can't assess exactly how strong that is, right? I'm sure there are pockets where it's real strong, pockets where it's not. But can you think of anywhere else that locals don't really trust the government? Anywhere else in the country? No. So, like, if that seed is already planted, it doesn't take much to sow disinformation. Messages that confirm existing biases have a way easier time planting and circulating in a group. Right? It is a key vulnerability in, a, in any group if there's a standing narrative and something happens that, like, fits that narrative already. Right? We talked about that in our disinformation episode. And, you know, at some point, there was an effort to refute that disinformation. It was just too little, too late. Uh, there's a website on FEMA.gov. You can go there and see what they wrote. We'll link to it in the show notes. Um, it's got things like, Rumor, if I apply for disaster assistance, FEMA may confiscate my property if they deem it unlivable. Fact, that is not true. FEMA cannot seize your property. Thank you, FEMA. Rumor. FEMA will not provide me disaster assistance unless I sign over my property or land. Fact, this is not true. FEMA disaster assistance is provided free of charge and does not require you to transfer ownership of your property or land. <laughs> you can kind of see a theme there. Here's the rumor. No, it's not. Okay, great. Uh, but it's not particularly charismatic or sticky or shareable or persuasive. But you can kind of see the themes they were hitting. The feds are taking your land. Don't bother applying for help. Again, standing narratives are particularly ripe soil for disinformation and misinformation. If there's already a vibe that the government or rich outsiders are coming for your land, it doesn't take much to get those myths and rumors going. The time to refute the myth and the rumor is before the disaster. FEMA, in my opinion as a taxpayer, needs to educate the public about what they can and can't do, what they will and won't do, before the crisis in order to inoculate against the misinformation mill, right? There's a lot of, of understanding now post Katrina and post th this event that FEMA will come in, they'll give you a $700 check and that's all they're good for. And sometimes that is literally true. Like that's what they will do. They will cut you a check. Uh, that's their role, honestly, is to get money moving. Um, but they're not a replacement for insurance. And if there's one lesson to take from this, if you talk to the survivors or watch interviews of the survivors of this fire, the quality of your insurance matters, right? In terms of your ability to rebuild after a fire. So are there takeaways in this uplifting story? Well, I think there are lots. I think the understanding notification communication is a big deal. I think that no matter which side of that equation you're on, whether you're a citizen out in the world, whether you're a cop, whether you're the director of emergency management, I think knowing what to send, how to send it um, in order to be useful in the moment in a disaster is a huge deal. But more importantly, kind of the thing I really want you to take is like, what risks have shifted in your sphere in the last couple of years, especially those like insidious slow ones, right? And the incremental ones, it may not be the ones you think. Now think about your geographic area. What has changed in your town in the last 20 years? Has crime changed? Think about risk in your job. You know, the area of responsibility that is your job. If you're a cop, has risk changed really for you in the last 10 years? Has your, your driving situation gotten more or less safe in the last 10 years? And think about for you personally. And that's all kinds of things. It's violent crime. That's wildfires. What about your risk of heart attack? I'll give you a hint. We're all getting older. <laughs> okay. And also, um, I've been on cholesterol meds since I was in my 20s. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, when 
when Mike and I look around our agencies collectively, we notice like, ooh, these guys are getting real young and real inexperienced. Well, question on that. Is that <laughs> really happening? <laughs> are they getting younger or are you just getting older? But there's real risks, like, in a, in a flying sense. Like, a lot of the guys who have two, 3,000 hours, they're leaving for the airlines, right? And so, seriously, a lot of the pilots I work with have under 1,000 hours. And they're doing very complicated, tricky missions. Um, that absolutely changes the risk situation for us. Um, I can tell you, for me personally, my pattern of life has changed a lot in the last 10 years. My risk situation has changed a lot. I have a wife and two kids and two dogs and a subdivision. My odds of fighting in Indo-Paycom... Uh, they've gone up by an order of magnitude in the last 10 years. Um, so there's that on the professional side. <clears throat> it's a different risk situation than fighting in Afghanistan or Iraq. Some parts are better. Some parts are worse, mostly worse. My odds of ending up in a life raft somewhere in indo have gone way up <laughs> as someone who will fly there someday. Right. Um, Personally, I used to live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where crime was spiraling. Well, now I don't live there. I live in a sleepy little resort town, and crime is effectively, knock on wood, non-existent for the most part. We have other crimes. We have white-collar crimes. We don't have the street crime stuff that Albuquerque does. So, like, my odds of dealing with a carjacker have dropped dramatically uh, also in that time I turned 40, my blood pressure and my cholesterol <laughs> are way bigger deals now than like my risk of an unplanned pregnancy. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> so my lifestyle has changed. Let yeah. me tell you. Ugh. Uh, and so I, I challenge you, dear listener, it, like stop and look around and look for those like slow shifts. Those little, like, like tectonic shifts in your risk situation. Is your area getting drier? Is it getting windier? Is it getting um, less rain? Is it getting a lot more rain? Are you seeing more flooding? Um, how's your health changed in the last 10 years? Like stop and do the assessment that that operational risk management. There's a reason why it's this like never ending cycle and reassess is part of that cycle. So I offer that to you. Um, to wrap up, just uh, if, if you're listening to this from Hawaii or from Maui or particularly from Lahaina, know that um, we're thinking about you and we're thinking about the people you lost, the family you lost. Uh, I don't feel right saying you're Ohana because I am I am not of you, uh, but I respect you and I appreciate what you went through and what you're still going through. And uh, know that when we do this episode, we're doing it with love and we're doing it with a desire to get the next one right. And I think there are good lessons to take from it. And that's why we're doing it. Yeah, when I think about lessons, I think the concept of initiative is a big deal and not being passive, right? Don't just be a passenger. And I'm not saying that that people missed the signs or, or any of those things. I'm just saying that if there are signs that things can go sideways, you know, be the person that breaks the cycle. Be the person that catches it in the act and and stops it in its tracks, that grabs the bull by the horns. Be that be that guy or gal. So I think that's the, the concept of initiative is a big deal. And on the emergency management side of it, I think understanding that the disaster picture isn't just like a police and fire problem. There's a whole lot of infrastructure when it goes into that. And that's, it, it runs the, the spectrum of like the power company, the roads and streets, like the transportation people. And then even just like your, your local politics, right? Like all, all of that plays into um, the big picture there. I think that's something worth considering. As it relates to decision-making, I think that the competing priorities is a big thing. I go back to, I, I really think that the down power lines versus turning people into the fire, 
Like that's a, that's a very classic example of competing priorities to me. Like oh yeah. That's a, that's a problem that like, huh, <laughs> how do you, it, it's like a trolley problem, you know? Yeah. It's one of those. Yeah. So Dilemma. think, think about that. Um, and if you don't know what I mean, when I say the trolley problem, Google it. And fire as a whole, we mentioned at the beginning and, and Jim kind of wrapped up with, we're not trying to like throw shade, right? Like, or criticize people. Wildfire is wild. <laughs> like, like the, these things are a big deal and a big disaster and a big problem for a reason. This is a difficult situation. And I think it only gets more complex when you make it happen on an island. So we need to make sure that we're like paying close attention to whatever science, research, training, uh, equipment, resources, infrastructure, whatever we have to do to make sure that we can manage that problem. And like, like Jim said, and like a lot of these things, it's not unique to the island or Maui or Hawaii. That, that's a, that's a, a common theme that we see in a lot of places. So I think that we ought to give more attention to that in terms of uh, disasters and survival stuff and being a prepper or whatever, like just risk management, risk assessment. Yeah, one alibi. Uh, we're going into election year. It, people are going to get super animated about Trump or Biden or Obama or Abraham Lincoln, whoever's running. <laughs> it's very tempting to get all about that level of politics. But I will offer, as a student of politics, um, all politics is local. All politics is local. It all comes down to like zoning, if you really want to get to the brass tacks. Uh, I challenge you start a conversation with your local fire department, with your local cops, with your mayor, with your city council, with your county commissioner, county, whoever runs your county, um, and ask them what they're doing about emergency preparedness and disaster preparedness and ask them about their resourcing. And if you don't like the answers you're getting, do something about it. Get involved at the politics at the local level on this. And, you know, whatever other politics you have, that's cool. But, like, we all pay the bill. <laughs> Literally, we're all paying taxes. And we're all going to face a fire someday. Or a earthquake. Or a nuclear plant disaster. Or something. And we have every day from now till then to get our shit in the sock. So let's do it. That's all I got. That's all I got. Yeah. Be safe out there. Be smart out there. We'll see you around. All right, guys, that's all we got for tonight. This episode is brought to you by Drip Drop. Drip Drop Oral Rehydration Solution is an electrolyte powder that you mix with water. It was formulated by a doctor for quick absorption. I work in the desert, and it only takes a few hours in the heat, wearing body armor, carrying around a bunch of gear before I start feeling like crap and fall behind the curve in dehydration. Drip Drop keeps you in the fight so you can finish the mission and rehab for the next one. Go get you some at dripdrop.com or on Amazon or ask your supply guy to find it for you. This episode is also brought to you by Zero Nine Holsters. We talk a lot about people, ideas, and hardware on this show. So when we invest in equipment, we always think in terms of experience first. Zero Nine is helping you figure out how to carry the gear you need to be effective. They are built by cops, for cops, with a minimalist design and bomb-proof durability. Radio cases, flashlights, body cameras, even canine remotes, you name it, Zero Nine has been filling a void in tactical duty holsters for more than a decade. Go see what they offer at Zero Nine Holsters, that's Z-E-R-O, the number nine, holsters.com. Zero Nine, built to win the fight. Don't forget that we put out new episodes on the 1st and the 15th of every month. If you like what we're doing, you can have our Patreon. Give us a buck for each new episode. That money's going to go back into bringing you good content. If you want to interact with us, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are at TacTangents. You can also email info at tacticaltangents.com. And one last thing, our uh, Facebook discussion group. We've got a little group going on Facebook. If you go to the groups tab on our page, you can join it. Um, we've got more followers on our page than we have in the group. So I know there's some of you out there following the Facebook page that are on Facebook that are not in the group. Lots of like-minded people in there. Uh, so come hang out with us. Uh, all right. That's all we got. Good talk.